been doing a lot of thinking lately about a, a, a myth, an old myth. And um, the reason I'm thinking is because I'm trying to decide what way I should write about this myth as to whether I should incorporate it into the next uh, book or one of the next in the series of the Lotello series because I plan to write a series of these dialogues between the Chandri and the boy or whether I should um, incorporate it into Peace to the Sky which is a book that I wanted to write about making ancient mythology relevant to today or looking at ancient mythology and seeing if there's any wisdom within it that could be used to help us in today's situation. Um, I really don't know what to do. I could, I suppose I could incorporate it into both the novel uh, and, you know, a work of non-fiction, uh, like I have done, you know, in certain aspects of, you know, the the research for Newgrange Monument Immortality, uh, for instance, about the near-death experience, uh, have been incorporated into Land of the Ever-Living Ones. That's, a, 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 I suppose, a choice that I'm going to have to hopefully get some guidance from the cosmos on. Hopefully I'll get some signs and synchronicities that will help me. But <clears throat> I've long been asked... Uh, and I remember in the early days of researching the Boyne Valley and all the mythology, I remember being asked a few times over the years a very interesting question that I couldn't really answer. And the question is this, does Ireland have a creation myth? Because almost every country and almost every tradition has a creation myth. And... I um, I said, well, well, in fact, what happens in Ireland is that, you know, one of our most ancient story stories or collections of story connections of stories is the Book of the Takings, the Leber Gawala, Lower Gawala, the uh, the so-called Book of Invasions, the Book of the Taking of Ireland, and. Um, you know, this is the fairly widely known um, story of basically how in ancient times Ireland was invaded by wave after wave of invaders. You know, the Parthalonians and the Nemedians and the Fir Bullock and the Fomorians and the Tuatadanan and the Milesians. Uh, and, um, well, anyway, that book begins with the granddaughter of Noah. She was called Kessair, C-E-S-S-A-I-R. Coming to Ireland to take refuge from the coming del deluge because she believed that Ireland was basically free from stain because nobody lived here. So therefore, um, a judgment of God, an angry judgment of God, which the deluge represented, couldn't affect Ireland. So she thought in coming here, she'd be okay. And uh, she came here with, I think, was two or three men and thrice fifty women, but uh, almost all of them died. So that was a mistaken belief. But Kazair is the granddaughter of Noah, and I think that's, you know, an obviously contrived effort to make a connection to connect Ireland's uh, heritage with that of the Old Testament and to therefore, you know, prove us, as it were, as, you know, some sort of uh, descendants from, uh, from from Adam, from Noah. But, um, uh, it was only within the past couple of years that a stunning realisation struck me. Uh, I've long known about the obscure and very brief story about the killing of the Mata, M-A-T-A, or sometimes Matai, M-A-T-A-E. The Mata was a four-headed, 100-legged monster. And the, the legend about it is all too brief, doesn't give us much detail. 
the monster was slain at Bruna Vania, you know, at, at, in the bend of the Boyne at New Range, and was torn limb from limb and thrown into the Boyne River. And the story says that its shin bone formed the Boyne estuary, which is called Inverculpa, and the Kultha, C O L P T H A, is a shin bone. So that's one very variation, one version of the story of how Inverculpa got its name. Another version is that it was Kulpa, one of the Milesian brothers, who was killed when they came to take the country from the Tuatha de and that was buried on the shore of the Boyne, hence the name Inverculpa. But the story about the Mata says that its shin bone formed the Boyne estuary, its breast bone formed the coast, and that another part of it, I can't remember, uh, formed um, the Dublin, down the river, I think, down in Dublin, uh, the Liffey. So, this was a story that was only contained in a couple of books about Irish mythology that I have in my collection. So it's obscure. It's not widely recalled. Lady Gregory suggests that in one of her books that the Mata was some sort of an underwater a submarine turtle, huge turtle-like creature. I'm not exactly sure where she gets that from. But anyway, I'm going to make a disconnection between the story of the Flood and the story of the Mata. But I'm also going to make a connection, a very strong connection between the two. I, I think that the story of Kessair is contrived to a large extent and contrived by Christian scribes, as I said, to try and put a certain gloss on Ireland's heritage and its past. Uh, the Mata, on the other hand, is uh, probably more akin to what you would call an indigenous creation myth. <clears throat> Within recent uh, years, I read a book by Philip Freund um, about creation myths. And he, what he did was he studied creation mythology from around the world. And um, he, it was a comparative study. So he was able to compare stories from different parts of the globe. And he found that there were five major um, cre creation myths, basically. There were five themes, five um, <coughs> structures, story structures, into which most creation mythology seemed to fit. One of them, uh, quite unsurprisingly, involves a great flood, a deluge, that wipes out most of humanity. And this is something I read in, in Graham Hancock's work as well. Because the story of Noah and his ark is actually present in mythologies around the globe, in far-flung parts of the globe, including the Pacific, where there's a story about a flood that wipes out most of mankind, and the story of a, a lone survivor in a boat, sometimes a man and a woman. Sometimes they have, you know, uh, some creatures that they try to save. This story is familiar in ancient traditions around the globe, probably reflecting a real event at some time in the past. Another of the five major creation myths that Freund identified from his studies was this idea of the killing of a monster. And not just the killing of a monster, but the dismembering of a monster and he seems to suggest that you know this is a this is a, a sort of a, a cosmogen a cosmogony a a beginning you know a cre a real creation uh, myth one of five major creation myths and when I read that uh, chapter when I had only read a few pages a very stark realization struck me that in actual fact this uh, creation myth was present in Irish mythology and for the first time in a long number of years I was actually finally able to answer the question when asked, does Ireland have a creation myth? Well it would appear that it does. It has a story about a monster that is dismembered which would fit in with a creation myth motif that is found in other parts of the world. 
the fact that it happens at Brunabonia is very interesting. Brunabonia may be seen as a cradle of modern organised civilization. Uh, I mentioned this in Newgrange Monument to Immortality, how previous to the Neolithic and previous to the influx of you know, farming methods and agriculture, that uh, we were very much a Mesolithic hunter-gatherer society and we didn't have any structure, whereas the Neolithic brought with it the time to create monuments and to build monuments. And I think that that was the foundation, and many other people do too, that's not a, a, an original idea on my part, but many people believe that the Neolithic marked the beginning of organised structure, structural civilization. But one of the things that I find very interesting about the destruction of the Mata is this idea of it being torn limb from limb, dismembered, torn into pieces basically. Freud suggests that in a cosmological sense, that, you know, the, I think he said that the blood of the creature forms the oceans, and that the uh, flesh and bones of the monster create the land, the islands and the ocean or whatever. And it's curious because we are an island in the ocean. But I am inclined to have a different thought about it, and, th and that is this. And as I said, I'm going to write about all this. But um, how I actually do that, in what frame I do that, uh, in, as part of a, a work of non-fiction or as part of a story, maybe I'll do both. I have a different, a slightly different thought in that, isn't it the case that, well, we could certainly consider that the monster represents the system, uh, the structure, uh, the world order, and I suppose in a way, because it's a monster and because it's huge, uh, it's fearful, it's frightening, that in actual fact the monster represents what the world has become and what its people have become, and that it's not nice. And in some ways that has a reflection upon the modern situation because, you know, we live in a world that has become a hell of a monster in some ways. Beautiful in others. And that perhaps it was necessary to kill this monster because it was destructive. And it was only going to uh, it was only going to be a a source of, of malevolence and bad for the world. But the other thing that I thought was that it was also necessary to create elements of the new world from the physical remains of the monster. And that is, to me, an indication that while you acknowledge that the old system and the old world is not working and you want to destroy it, you still must build your new world upon the same, well you need to build it in the same world basically. You can't just leave that world behind and go somewhere else. So in essence elements of the old world are incorporated into the new creation. We uh, want to create a new world, we destroy the old one, but we absolutely must um, create the new world within the old one. As well as that, we recognise that although it's only a corpse, fragments of a corpse, um, we acknowledge that we are not completely free from the monster. Its physical remains incorporated into the new world are a reminder to us of the monster that the old world became and are a reminder to us that the monster that we can become uh, when we are driven by certain um, motivations and certain factors. Uh, as people, we are naturally inclined to contend with each other over, as I said in a previous video, over you know possessions and territories and land, the ownership of things. So it's maybe it may be a recognition that you know we we we, we, we must acknowledge that the old world. Uh, they still have a presence in the new one. The other interesting thing about it is that, you know, if it was a judgment, you know, uh, against the old world for being corrupted and for being, you know, uh, malevolent, 
uh, and you know f f for for heading in the wrong direction, as it were. Well, then in some similar, in some ways, it's similar to the story of uh, Noah, where you know God is very much bringing the flood upon the world as a punishment, as a way of saying you know well you have uh, you, you you have gone against my will and you know. I think that you know, in some in some ways, that's the same sort of idea that the world had become a monster, and God decided He was going to kill the monster. It was a judgment, and so the judgment upon the monster is the same as the judgment upon the people when the flood is brought. But curiously, the two of them are tied, and here's the connection: the two of them are tied from the point of view that um, in ancient times, the territory which would contain Newgrange, uh, which was that north of the Boyne, between the Boyne and uh, the Castletown River in Dundalk, the modern county of Louth, okay, Newgrange is in me, but only just, that sort of area, that plain was known as Murahevna, which means the plain covered by the sea, and there is a suggestion that that is a, an echo of flood mythology, that in actual fact there was a time when Ireland was underwater, uh, albeit briefly. And as I said, Lady Gregory suggests that the Mata was in actual fact a uh, submarine creature, a great submarine turtle, and that the Dagda, I think, drained the waters from the plain. Uh, he was the chief of the gods, he was actually the sun god, uh, so that's interesting. Um, he drained the waters. Uh, so I suppose when, uh, and I'm only making this connection myself, I haven't read this, but I suppose in draining the waters, um, the monster became exposed on land, and perhaps that enabled, you know, the uh, the people of the time to uh, to kill it. There are a couple of monuments in the bend of the Boyne, mentioned in the the, the, the Dinchenicus, the uh, the collection of ancient place name mythology or uh, folklore, uh, which suggests that there is a, a valley of the Mata, and there's also. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, the grave of the matter, but um, he was said to have been killed, according to the smith, uh, on the Lick Ben. And uh, I'd love to know more about that, and what it actually is, because uh, I think a Lick means a grave or a burial place, but I'm not sure what this Ben means. I think it's B-E-N or B-E-N-N. -N. I think it's B-E-N-N. -N. That's where the monster was said to have been killed. I'm also interested in the cosmology of it because, or the astronomy of it, because the, Bo the Boyne River and the Milky Way were seen in ancient times as a reflection of each other. The Boyne is the Awen Bofinna, the, the river of the white cow, and the, Mil the Milky Way is the Balachna Bofinna, the way of the white cow. They're, they're, they're seen as a, a reflection of each other. And uh, that was the sort of cosmology that I think the builders of Newgrange had. And they saw Earth as a reflection of the heavens. And they saw that we were all part of this cosmic system. We were, you know, the stars may look as if they're remote and detached and aloof, but in actual fact, we're very much caught up in their movements. And that a lot of what happens, or most of what happens on the Earth, is influenced by the movements of the sky. So that's the story of the Mata, and it, I believe, is Ireland's original indigenous creation myth. And unfortunately, I think that the story of Kesser uh, fleeing the flood, and the fact that she's related to Noah, um, I think suggests a contrivance. I think that one is uh, has been uh, transcribed or um, transposed upon... Um, you know, our mythology at some stage, whereas I think that the story of the monster is the one that's truly indigenous. And interestingly, uh, the Kazair one is, the Kazair story is the one that is, um, you know, widely known. And the story of the Mata is the one that remains relatively obscure. And I believe that's one of the reasons that it has remained obscure, is because its meaning has remained obscure and that we haven't had any way up to now of making any sense of it. But as Ireland's creation myth, it takes on an entirely different complexion.